that. <laughs> I'll come on to that. <laughs> okay. So, I will, as I said, I'll focus mainly on WIMPs, but if time permits at the end, I'll come on to just mention briefly some other dark matter candidates, in particular axions and stereoanalyticurinos, if only to make the point that WIMPs aren't the only well-motivated dark matter candidate. So what I'm going to do, I'm not going to go into a lot of mathematical detail. At the end, I can point you to a reference where you can see all the Feynman diagrams you want to see. What I'm going to do is try and focus on the sort of motivation for WIMPs very briefly, and then look at the detection, try and motivate what the sort of principles are, what the problems are when you actually try and do this in practice, the current status, and then finally what sort of progress we can expect over the next few years. OK, I'll try. <laughs> I whoops, skipped a slide there. Okay, so the generic motivation for WIMPs is simply that any stable, weakly interacting massive particle, which is in thermal equilibrium in the early universe, ends up having roughly the right density today to be the dark matter. And so what happens is these WIMPs are their own antiparticles, so they can annihilate producing sort of all sorts of other particles. And in the un early universe, where everything is very hot and dense, you can also get this reaction going the other way, producing WIMPs. And so this plot here shows the co-moving number density as a function of time. So the co-moving number density just scales out the expansion. And so at very early times when very, things are very hot and dense, this reaction goes in both directions, and you end up with a constant co-moving number density. However, as the universe expands and cools, what happens is the other particles don't have enough energy to carry on making WIMPs. So at this point, this reaction can only go in this direction. So if this was the end of the story, what you'd find is this number, moving number density would just drop off exponentially towards zero, and we'd be left with no particles to be the dark matter. However, because the particles are weakly interacting, eventually the rate in this direction, the reaction ceases, and what we end up with the dark matter doing what's called freezing out, and you're left with a co-moving number density. So you can actually do a very rough back-of-the-envelope calculation, and the number of particles you're left with today depends on the point at which this freeze-out occurs, which is determined by the annihilation cross-section. And so very roughly, it happens when the annihilation rate is roughly equal to the Hubble expansion rate, and you end up with a present-day density which is related to the annihilation cross-section, thermally averaged with the velocity, like this. And then you can make a very simple argument that if your particle is interacting via the weak interaction, the cross-section is given by some expression like this, where G is a coupling strength, and this is of the weak scale. If you put in some typical numbers, you end up with roughly the right order. You need to give a density of order one today. So that's the very generic motivation, but obviously we need an actual concrete candidate if we really want to take this seriously. So what we need is an extension to the standard model of particle physics, which has a stable neutral particle with weak scale couplings to the standard model particles. And so fortunately, we do have actually several possibilities, the most popular of which is supersymmetry. So I should emphasize that now in particle physics model building, having a viable dark matter candidate is often used as a motivation for building new models. But that wasn't a reason for inventing supersymmetry. There are more deeper reasons for supersymmetry. So very simply, in supersymmetry, every standard model particle has a supersymmetric partner. Bosons have fermions and vice versa. And these particles are named so that you get a suffix eno or a prefix s. With s. So you have squarks and fermions and gauge enos. And so there are various motivations for this. One of the biggest is what's called the gauge hierarchy problem, which is understanding why the weak scale is so much smaller than the Planck scale. And in particular, the mass of the Higgs particle, you'd expect radiative corrections to it, which would push it up towards the Planck scale. The way that supersymmetry solves this is the supersymmetric particles cancel off the contributions from their standard model particles, leaving the weak scale down where, we, where it needs to be. There's also the unification of coupling constants. If you look at the coupling constants of the sort of forces as a function of energy, they run, and it looks like they're going to unify. But in the standard model, they don't quite. However, if you add in supersymmetry, then you get this nice unification at a scale of about 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16 GeV. And then finally, it's not something I understand, but apparently, if you want to sort of do string theory and unify all the forces, then supersymmetry turns out to usually be an important feature of string theory. So here's our sort of 
particle physics model. Now, additionally, there's usually a conserved quantum number known as R parity, and that's required to prevent the proton decaying on a time scale smaller than the age of the universe. And a consequence of R parity is that supersymmetric particles can only be created and decay in pairs. And that means that the lightest of them is stable. It's got nowhere it can decay to. And typically, usually, but not always, the lightest supersymmetric particle is something called the lightest neutralino. It's a mixture of the supersymmetric particles partners of the photon, the Z, and the Higgs. And it turns out to have just the properties we need for dark matter. It's stable, and it's also neutral. So that's supersymmetry providing us with a concrete dark matter candidate. So I won't go into very much detail at all about supersymmetry models. I'll just say something very brief. So people usually work in the context of something which is called the minimal supersymmetric standard model. And it's basically the minimum extensions of the standard model with a minimum number of extra particles. There's a supersymmetric partner for every standard model particle plus some extra Higgs fields. Now, in the standard model even, there's a lot of what are essentially free parameters, but actually we measure experimentally. And similarly, in supersymmetry, we end up with more than 100 free parameters that aren't measured. So this would make it very difficult to do any concrete studies of what you might expect to see. So what people usually do is work within restricted frameworks. And the most popular of these is something called either MSUGRO or constrained MSSM. And so what this model does is assume that a lot of parameters, the masses and the couplings, unify at the gut scale. And so this reduces the free parameters of your model so you're only left with five. So I should emphasize this is the simplest framework, and a lot of the things I'll show you later on were cal calculated in this framework, but there are, of course, other more general models. Now, even five free parameters is quite a few, so the parameters are typically constrained by, in fact, the measured CDM density. And in fact, in MSUGRA, for an awful lot of the parameter space, you end up with too much dark matter. So it's actually cosmology is placing a significant constraint on these models. Also, supersymmetry, the processes could contribute to all sorts of other processes that are primed at colliders, in particular, the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon and the decay rate of B quarks into straight quarks and gammas. And so there are constraints from there as well on the parameters of these models. And there are several different approaches here. For instance, you can pick benchmark points, which are representative of the physics you might expect. In the past, people have often done parameter space scans, where you simply scan over all the particular parameters. And then an approach which has become more popular recently is doing the sort of Bayesian MCMC analyses that are popular in cosmology to also look into the parameters of supersymmetric models. So that's a very, very brief introduction to supersymmetry and supersymmetric models. I would just briefly mention another model just to emphasize that supersymmetry isn't the only game in town. This thing which has become popular over the last few years is thing called universal extra dimensions. So this is a model with compactified extra dimensions in which all of the fields, not just the gravity, can propagate in the compactified dimensions. It's got a similar set of motivations to supersymmetry, trying to sort of solve problems with the standard model. And so in this case, for the, for the particles which propagate in the extra dimensions, they're quantized, they have a tower of what's called kaluza klein states. Now, yet again, we have a conserved quantum number. In this case, it's something called KK parity, and it's required to ensure momentum conservation in this case. So similarly, as R parity renders the lightest supersymmetric particle stable, KK parity renders the lightest kaluza klein particle stable. In this case, it's usually the first excitation of the photon, and it's a good dark matter candidate, just like the lightest supersymmetric particle. So this is basically, I'm just emphasizing here that yes, supersymmetry is probably our best bet for giving us a dark matter candidate, but it's, it's not the only possibility. So given what we've got some particle physics ideas as to what the WIMPs could be, how are we going to detect them? And broadly, there are three methods. You can detect them directly, indirectly, or you can make them at colliders. And I'll go through each of these three possibilities. So direct detection, we're sat in the Milky Way. We believe the Milky Way has a dark matter halo. So there'll be a huge number of WIMPs passing through this room every second. Because they're weakly interacting, most of them will stream straight through, but a small amount of them will interact with nuclei in the tables in our bodies. And so what you'd like to do is build a dedicated detector to detect these interactions. So what happens is your WIMP comes in, scatters off a nuclei, WIMP goes away again, and the nuclei recoils, depositing energy in the detector. And so what you're trying to do is detect the energy deposited in the detector by the recoil. So there are 
two types of interaction between the, weak, for the WIMP and the nucleus, spin-independent and spin-dependent, are focused entirely on the simpler spin-independent interaction, partly because it's simpler and partly because that's what most of the current generation of experiments are sensitive to. So this is expression for the differential event rate, number of events per unit detector mass, per unit time, and per unit KEV. So it's directly proportional to the interaction cross-section and also the local density, so there's a degeneracy there. This thing F is the form factor which takes into account that the nuclei aren't point particles. And then you've got the kinematics of the elastic scattering which comes in here through this factor which is an integral over the local WIMP speed distribution. Where the minimum speed is, sort of comes from the kinematics of what the minimum speed that can cause a recoil of energy E is. And so if you actually sort of have a real experiment, what you need to do is multiply this by something called the exposure. That's the detector mass times the time it's running for to get the energy spectrum which you'd actually see. So there are a number of signals you can look for. That equation, I didn't actually explicitly point it out, but there was an A squared factor in the front of it. That's the mass of the target nuclei. And so the spectra depend on not only the WIMP mass, but also the target mass. And so here I've plotted here for germanium and xenon, which are two common targets. The spectrum, as a function of energy, you expect for different masses. And so what you could ideally do is do two experiments, two different targets, and check that the spectra you get match up. There are other signals which actually come from the Earth's motion. So obviously our detector is sat on the Earth. The Earth's going around the Sun at about 30 kilometers a second, and the Sun goes around the center of the galaxy at about 220 kilometers a second. So this is a bit like driving your car into the rain. The first thing you see is you're going to get more particles coming at you from the forward direction. So this is a plot of the WIMP flux. This is the direction that the Sun's going in, and the WIMP flux is very tightly concentrated around the direction the Sun's going in. When you do an actual experiment, the concentration is not so so sharp because of the scattering, but nonetheless you get a very sharp rear-forward asymmetry. There'd be more than an order of magnitude more events in the forward direction. So that's a very, very nice signal, but the problem is that you then need to build a detector sensitive to not just the energies of the recalls, but their directions, and I'll say a little bit more about that later on. There's another signal which comes from the Earth's velocity, and that's because the Earth's going around the Sun, our net velocity varies over the course of the year. It's largest in the summer when we're going parallel to the Sun's direction, and smallest in winter when we're coming back. And so I've used a very simple speed distribution here, and I'll come back to that later. And you can see there's a very small shift that in summer you have more high-speed particles and less low-speed particles. And so what this translates into is a very small modulation of the wind flux. It's actually not quite as bad as that plot makes out. It's energy dependent, and so what I've plotted here is essentially the amplitude of the modulation as a function of energy, and you can see it's a few percent. So that's something you could detect with an ordinary detector, but because it's a small effect, you need a big detector, you need to run it for a long time, you need a large exposure. <coughs> So practicalities, well firstly experimental stuff, these particles are weakly interacting so the event rate is very small, you're talking less than one event per month per kilogram of detector. The recoil energies are typically very small, of order KEV, and then as with everything backgrounds are an issue. And there are two types of backgrounds, you can get electron recoils caused by alphas and gammas, and then, which also deposit energy in the detector, and then you can get neutrons coming from cosmic rays or local radioactivity, and they can cause nuclear recalls in exactly the same way that WIMPs do. So how do you get around these things? Well, small event rate, you build a big detector, low energies, you try and push the energy threshold down as far as you can. For the background, you have to be a bit more cunning, and what people usually do here is the energy deposited can show up in one of a number of channels, ionization, scintillation, or phonons, and so what experimentalists typically do is use targets where they can use two of these energy channels, and this helps differentiate the nuclear recalls for the electron recalls. However, you've still got to differentiate your WIMP-induced nuclear recalls from neutron-induced ones. So the game here is you want to block out the neutron backgrounds. So these experiments are done in mines deep underground. That's to block out the cosmic rays. And then you also have to be aware of local radioactivity. And so this is a picture of the Zeppelin III experiment at the Bulby Mine in England. Here's the actual detector. And here it is shielded by thick lead blocks. So you know the backgrounds are an issue, but these guys are trying hard and think they have them under control. So what about theoretical issues? Well, 
From particle physics point of view, there's a lot of freedom in the parameters, and so the elastic scattering cross-section can vary by many orders of magnitude. And I'll show you a plot of that in a moment. Now, Simon's already mentioned, from the astrophysics point of view, the event rate and the signals depend on the ultra-local WIMP's density and velocity distribution. So that is what we need to know the WIMP distribution in our detector down a mine. So it's not as bad as that we need to know it on metre scales because obviously the Earth is moving. Over the course of a year, the Earth moves a fraction of a milliparsec. So we're ending up probing the dark matter distribution on sub milliparsec scales. And so Simon's already showed us these plots. These are the latest results from the Aquarius simulation. The black lines to show you the sort of typically used velocity distribution, which I've already showed you, called the sort of standard halo model. And the red lines show plots of the velocity distribution from their simulations. There are significant differences here, but they're not game-stopping differences. They're something which needs to be taken into account, but they're not a big worry. The one caveat I'd emphasise, though, is that these velocity distributions are measured on kiloparsec scales. So there's still an extrapolation down to the milliparsec scales. I think Simon would argue that on the milliparsec scales you'd see something similar. I'm not yet 100% convinced of that. Can I answer that at the end? <laughs> And so now that's the practicalities, what's the current status? Well, I'll start with the null results because they're easier. So there's a large number of experiments around the world, and this is a lot of information on this slide, but in each case I've listed the name of the experiment, what target they're using, their exposure, their energy threshold, and then the channels they're looking at. And so the experimental results are really constraints on an event rate, but they get presented in terms of constraints in this cross-section mass parameter plane. And so these are calculated assuming a sta the standard halo model with the Maxwellian speed distribution and a local density of 0.3 GeV per cubic centimetre. If we use a slightly different velocity distribution, the shapes of these would change. And if you change the local density, the curves would shift up and down. So the solid lines are all current experimental constraints. And so as you can see, that CDMS and Xenon 10, they've been taking it in turns to push the, the limits down over the last couple of years. Zeppelin 3, a British experiment, so I'm biased, has just got some good competitive limits in here. And then there are various other experiments. There's two I've mentioned down here, Cogent and Texono. So naively, they don't look particularly good. They've got small exposures. They've got weak constraints up here. But what they do have is low threshold energies, which means that they're sensitive to this region of small wind masses. And it'll become evident in a moment why that's interesting. So as well as the current experimental limits in solids, I've also plotted projections of what these experiments can do in the near future. So the big question is, you know, how does this match up to our theoretical expectations? Which is the, uh, the, the difference in colours? Which is the one that kind of says another magnitude larger? To be honest, I wouldn't take these too seriously. I, 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 <laughs> These are almost back of the envelope calculations, but I, I mean, officially, the, the, those, the dashed lines are sort of timescales of months, dotted ones, timescales of years. But to be honest, I wouldn't take the difference in between the projections particularly seriously. The most promising is what, Crest or Xenon 10? Um, well, both CDMS and Xenon 10 have got ske good ske plan scale up things. I mean, I think there's possibly an issue with CDMS that germanium is very expensive, but, but they're both planning to scale up to the ton scale. So here's the same plot with some theoretical predictions on it. The black dots are benchmark models, and the blobby regions come from a Monte Carlo Markov chain analysis of the simplest supersymmetric model. So this looks brilliant. I mean, one thing that's definitely true is, given the theoretical astrophysics assumptions, that these experiments are beginning to probe the predicted parameter space. And that in the near future, we can get really right down into the thick of it. The one caveat I would really add, though, is that these are for the simplest supersymmetric models. Once people look at more complicated frameworks, you can get cross-sections that come right down off the bottom of this plot. So things are looking good, but it's not a definite banker by any means. So that was the current status in terms of null results. There's actually an experiment claiming a signal. And so this is the DAMA experiment, and it's been claiming a signal now for sort of over a decade. So they're using a different approach. All of the experiments I've talked about so far use very small targets and try and control their backgrounds. Because if you see nothing, you know you're seeing nothing. Whereas Dharma have used the approach, they'll build a bigger experiment, they'll run it for a long time. They won't worry so much about backgrounds. They know that a lot of what they're seeing is background, but they're trying to look for this annual modulation signal on the top. So here's a plot of their residuals, that's with the mean event rates subtracted, 
over the sort of decades that they, or more that they've been taking data for. So they've accumulated a huge amount of data. And I think this one thing nobody disputes is that they're very definitely seeing an annual modulation in their event rate. And so the idea here is that the total event rate is background plus a signal, the modulation in it. But what you don't know is the divide of what's background and what's signal. So your big question would be, why aren't we all very excited about this? Is this real or not? So, so one thing I've got a technicality I've got to mention before I can get onto the interpretation is that something that's changed and is recent in this is that they're claiming this a phenomenon which affects the interpretation, something called channeling. So DAMA is a sodium iodide experiment with a crystal. And so typically only a small, some fraction of the energy which you measure, you only measure a fraction of the recoil. But what they're saying is that actually if you get events that go along one of the axes of the crystal, you actually end up measuring all of the recoil energy. And this ends up changing how you interpret their signal. And so there's been a large number of theory papers this year trying to sort of compare the DAMA results with other, other results. And so this is a calculation by Savage et al. And so the allowed regions are these blobs. You get two allowed regions, one at larger masses for scattering off of iodine, and one at smaller masses for scattering off of sodium. And then I've also got the blue and the green regions, which are with and without this channeling feature. So what you see, if the channeling doesn't occur, then there's really very little doubt that with a, with a standard set of astrophysical assumptions, that DAMA is not compatible with the other experiments. And in particular, you can see these Texona and cogent experiments that I mentioned that are very important at constraining this low mass region. On the other hand, if the channeling does occur, then there's this marginal compatibility here, and by changing the WIMP speed distribution to a sort of more motivated form, you could possibly move these constraints around. So there's a big tension between DAMA and the other experiments, but, but it's difficult to rule DAMA out is the bottom line. So what about the future prospects? Well, as I mentioned before, all the current experiments have got plans to scale up. So for instance, CDMS wants to become super CDMS, and Xenon is, well, we've had Xenon 10, there's going to be Xenon 100 kilograms, and then Xenon a ton, hopefully, to sort of scale things up. And there's new experiments in particular, I know in Europe, um, the European collaborations, Advisors and Crest, are teaming up to form something called Eureka. So with these ton scale detectors that are planned, we really would be sensitive to a significant fraction of the theoretically predicted parameter space. Tr trying to look on the bright side, let's say we see something, what would we want to do then? So obviously you collect some more data, and once you're convinced that you really are seeing a WIMP signal, then you can start measuring the WIMP mass and cross section, and potentially start distinguishing between different candidates. Back when I was talking about the principles, I mentioned this directional signal. And so that's very nice and it's a clean signal, but the difficulty is nuclear recoils in a solid are absolutely a tiny distance. There's no way you can measure them. So if you want to measure this directional signal, you've got to build a gaseous target and you've got to, and it's a tough thing to do, but then there are a number of collaborations who are really getting to the point they've got detectors that can potentially do this. So if we actually get with the conventional experiments detecting WIMPs, then we could sort of switch to focusing on directional detectors. This would be neat for several reasons. It would be a really very robust demonstration that we really are seeing WIMPs and not a neutron background. And then by looking at the details of the recoil signal, you could start doing WIMP astronomy, start probing the sort of features that Simon mentioned in his talk. So that's direct detection. Now come on to indirect detection. So in this case, what you're doing is looking for the products of annihilation. So remember that the whole motivation for WIMPs relies on the fact that there are their own antiparticles and they can annihilate with each other. And so what you're trying to do is detect the products of this annihilation, gamma rays, positrons, antiprotons, and neutrinos. So this cartoon shows what's going on. You get your neutrinos coming together annihilating, producing quarks, leptons, and bosons, that then fragment and decay to eventually produce things we can detect. And the fact that it's a two-step process will be important later on. So there's a number of particular places you can go looking. So gamma rays are nice in that they point back to the source. So you could ideally go looking in high-density regions. For instance, the galactic center, we expect the dark matter density there to be high. We expect there to be substructures within the halo, or you can just look for the diffuse emission. Antimatter is a little more complicated because charged particles obviously are affected by the Milky Way's magnetic field. So there we just sit here with a satellite and we have to see what antimatter comes from us. And we, they're typically probing a fairly local of order kiloparsec region of the Milky Way halo. Uh. 
so those are most of the indirect detection experiments are very similar, but the one that's different is neutrinos. And so what's going on here is that very, WIMPs with very low velocities, when they come close to the Sun or Earth, they can scatter, lose energy, and end up getting gravitationally captured. So they then thermalize inside the Sun or the Earth, and eventually some fraction of them will annihilate, producing all sorts of things. But the, thing, the annihilation projects that are interesting in this context are neutrinos, because the neutrinos can free stream out of the Sun. And so how you then go about detecting them is with neutrino telescopes. And so this example here, we've got a muon neutrino. Somewhere in the Earth, it sort of interacts to form a muon, which could then be protected detected by your neutrino telescope. So practicality, so all of what I'll say now just doesn't apply to the neutrinos, it applies to the gamma rays and the antimatter. So yet again, from particle physics, the particles you produce depend on the particle nature of the WIMPs. So in this case, it's not just a normalization thing, it's actually the spectra and nature of what you produce depends on the particle physics. And then we come on to the astrophysics, and so as Simon's already mentioned, because this is an annihilation project, it involves two particles, so the event rate's proportional to the density squared. And so obviously it depends on the dark matter distribution where you're looking. So obviously it's great that the simulators have turned their attention to this problem, and it's really refined what we can expect, but there's still nonetheless some issues here. So we're sitting in the Milky Way, so we need to sort of try and extract what the actual parameters of the real Milky Way density profile are, similar problems if you want to look at substructures like dwarf galaxies. And then the question is, especially if you're interested in looking at the galactic centre, there's uncertainties in how the baryons, and in particular the, super ma the massive black hole at the centre, affect things. And then also the density we expect to be largest in the centre of any halo, so as, as R tends to zero. And of course the simulations have finite resolution, so you have to extrapolate profiles down below what the simulations have resolved. And then another thing that's already been mentioned, that you can do that for smooth density profiles, but then you can have substructure, to some extent at least, potentially enhancing the signal. And this is pr parameterized as something which is called boost factor. Now often in particle physics circles, this is just treated as something you can just tune to whatever you want it to be. As we've actually heard earlier, you can't do that. It's something you can sort of model and come up with a handle on how large it can be. The one point I would emphasize, though, is it's not a single number. It depends on what species you're looking at, where you're looking, and even in some cases, what energy of the products you're looking at. So if there is an uncertainty here in the boost factor, but it's not a complete dodgy no-hope thing. So also I've mentioned as well, with the charged particles, they propagate in the Milky Way's field. So there are standard codes out here for solving it, things called girl prop, but it's nonetheless a complicated process. And then finally, the big, big issue here is backgrounds. I think backgrounds are always the big, big issue. And so in this case, what you need to do is differentiate the products of WIMP annihilation from astrophysical backgrounds. And so what you're really looking is for some sort of smoking gun signal. And so there are possibilities, for instance, you can get features in the spectrum. For instance, if you can get your WIMPs annihilating directly to gamma rays, you get a line. And that would be very nice, but unfortunately, in most regions of parameter space, the flux from that line is tiny. So this is something which could be possible, but is unlikely. There's been some more recent work by Leish Bergstrom and his collaborators looking at oh, another sort of final state radiation, and they seem to show some more promising features in the spectrum. But I think that's work in progress. One thing you could potentially do is look at different targets and see the same sort of spectrum. That might give you some confidence that what you were seeing was WIMP annihilation. And then another thing is that obviously you're getting think the annihilation is producing all sorts of products. You can look at different wavelengths. And for instance, if you thought your WIMPs are producing lots of positrons, well, in the inner regions of the galaxy, you're going to get synchrotron radiation. So you can go looking for that and check that the synchrotron radiation matches with your interpretation of the positrons. So I think that obviously indirect detection is promising, but there's going to have to be a lot of cross checks done to really sort of make sure you've got a convincing signal once you think you've seen something. So what's the current status? Well, I'll go back to the neutrinos first. These are very old plots from Joachim Ezio, but I don't think much has changed. So these are plots of the muon flux from the sun and the earth as a function of neutralino mass. The lines are the sort of reach of experiments, as in how far down in this parameter space they can get. This, concentrate, there's a solid black line, which is from Amanda, and this is a projection for Ice Cube. The points are from a scan of supersymmetric super models parameter space, and the color coding is that the green models were already ruled out by CDMS in 2005. So 
what you're seeing is that actually the neutrinos probe the same sort of physics as the direct detection experiments. And at the moment, at least, the direct detection experiments look to be the better way of doing this. The only case they wouldn't be was if the local density varied lots. And in that case, the neutrinos would be the better thing to look at. So coming on to the other things, I'll start with gamma rays. So uh, at the moment, we've got data coming from air Cherenkov telescopes like HESS. And for instance, HESS has looked at the galactic center, and there's a very powerful source of high energy gamma rays there. For a while, people tried to interpret those observations in terms of dark matter particles, in particular, Kaluza Klein particles. But the observations now extend up to an energy of about 20 TeV, and you just really can't fit them with a sensible dark matter candidate. So the problem with that as well is that there's obviously there's something astrophysical at the galactic center kicking out high energy gamma rays, and that's going to be a background for dark matter searches towards the galactic center. So whilst the galactic center you might have thought was promising because of the high density, unfortunately astrophysics looks to get us there. Another thing you can do is go looking at dwarf galaxies. These are supposed to be dark matter dominated, so you'd think they'd be a good place to look. And a range of the uh, Cherenkov telescopes had looked at dwarf galaxies. They haven't seen anything yet, so what you can do is place constraints on the annihilation cross-section. They depend a little bit on how you model the dark matter profile, but at the moment those constraints are very, very weak. They're really only just beginning to get to the regions of parameter space where we sort of expect there might be something. In terms of satellites, we've got data already from the EGRET satellite, and this is a plot of the flux as a function of energy. And so, again, we know there's going to be lots of ga gamma rays from backgrounds. So you try to model this by this Galprop code. And Wim de Boer and collaborators for many years have been claiming that there's an excess in gamma rays, which they explain by dark matter annihilation. This plot, the yellow region, is the background. They claim this is the uncertainty on the background. And what's left in red, they attribute to being a dark matter signal. So leaving aside sort of sort of issues with the background, it turns out that for them to fit this using dark matter, they have to come up with a really wacky model for the Milky Way halo, including great big rim, rings of dark matter, which just dynamically we don't think are there. So I think I mentioned this mainly just to emphasize that you, know, you can take some observations, you can fit it with some dark matter model, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you've definitely found dark matter. And in this case, actually, as I mentioned a moment, it turns out that anti-proton observations rule this out. So coming on to these antiprotons, the most recent data here comes from the Pamela satellite. It was launched a couple of years ago, and its first data was announced this summer. So first, the antiprotons. So this is a ratio of the flux of antiprotons to protons. Here we've got the data in red compared with various theoretical predictions from what you get from cosmic rays propagating within the Milky Way. And this compilation shows previous measurements. So what you're seeing here isn't very interesting on its own. What they found is compatible with previous measurements and also compatible with what you expect from known sources. So that basically here, there's no room for exotic contributions. So whilst that's not very interesting, it is actually very powerful from constraining other potential signals. And in fact, there's been work done by Bergstrom et al. showing that the egret gamma ray signal is ruled out by these sorts of observations. And well, I'll mention positrons in a moment. The Wim de Boer's interpretation of egret. So coming on to positrons, there's, there was an ex excess in positrons. It was it'd been attracting um, attention by particle physicists since measurements by the heat satellite, but actually apparently the data goes back much, much further than that. So what this Pamela has actually done is measured the positron flux divided by the positron plus electron flux. And so again, the red points are the data. And so this line, and you'll notice there are no error bars on this line, this line is the sort of what you'd expect from cosmic rays, and they're definitely seeing sort of a rise like this above it. And I think you can probably fairly generically argue that the sort of background should fall and not rise. And so again, here's a comparison with previous measurements. And so they're, they're really sort of confirming what was seen before, but at much higher precision. There's also been data from ATIC, which is shown here. It's a balloon-based experiment. Red points are all below the black ones. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm not sure how big. So actually, at low energies, you shouldn't worry about that. You expect a variation due to solar modulation. So, so the difference down here is not worth worrying about. Then they got energy. Exactly, yeah. And, and they sort of confirm this rise here. 
<coughs> so ATIC can't differentiate between electrons and positrons. It measures the total flux of the combined. And so again, here's the same sort of thing, theoretical expectations, previous data, and they're seeing this bump here. And so apparently, if you sort of make some simple fit to Pamela and extend it up to these higher energies that ATIC finds, the two are consistent. So it would seem to be indicating that there's something out there nearby chucking out lots more positrons than you would expect from cosmic rays. So as cosmic rays come through, they propagate in the Milky Way's magnetic field. It, it's messy, and you do the calculation, and you get positrons produced, and that would be the spectrum that you'd expect. No. So at the moment, you know, everybody likes a signal to work on, and especially with the LHC being delayed, there's a lot of bored particle physicists around. So there's been an awful lot of action, and it's almost a full-time business trying to keep up with the papers on the archive about this. So I'll try and summarise my understanding of the centrals of what's going on. So there's a signal here. Something is chucking out positrons. Could it be WIMPs annihilating? So the first problem is, as I showed you back at the beginning, to get the right density today, you need a sort of particular value of the annihilation cross-section. So if you've got that, you can then calculate the annihilation rate you expect today. And what you find is that it's much smaller than what you'd need to produce what Pamela's seeing. There are, however, rays around this. and some, You've got to sort of enhance the annihilation by a factor of getting on for 100. So it's been suggested that you could have a large boost factor by just sticking a large clump of dark matter within a few kiloparsecs. But I, I don't think anyone would seriously suggest that. I, I, as we heard earlier, the amount of substructure in the inner regions of the Milky Way in simulations is pretty small. There are other ways of en enhancing the annihilation cross-section, the difference being that the freeze-out calculation happens in the early universe when velocities are typically high. Today, velocities are substantially lower. And there are various particle physics mechanisms that could enhance the annihilation cross-section at small speeds. So I think it's been it's something called the Sommerfeld effect, which is basically a distortion of some wave functions in, in an interactions, which might occur if you had a new light boson. Another possibility, you could apparently have a formation of a wimponium bound state, so you get two wimps briefly bound together before annihilating. And apparently both of these things could potentially enhance the annihilation rate up to the size required to produce as many positrons as Pamela sees. So there's another problem, though, in that, as I mentioned in that picture back at the beginning of um, indirect detection, is that you don't with neutralinos, at least, get leptons produced directly. It's forbidden for helicity reasons. So what you have is intermediate things that then decay, finally producing leptons. And inevitably, when you do that, you end up with a spectrum which just doesn't look like what Pamela sees. It falls off more quickly. Also, even if you could try and produce lots more positrons, you end up producing lots more gamma rays and lots more antiprotons. And in particular, Pamela's own measurements of the antiproton flux end up making it very hard to produce so many positrons without violating their measurements of antiprotons. Now, of course, that's all in the context of the sort of supersymmetric models which people usually work on. You can conjure up other models which then kind of directly annihilate to leptons, avoiding this problem. <coughs> So, but I think the thing which bothers me most is that, you know, you want to be sure that this is something exotic and not something astrophysical. And so there's been various papers claiming, and it looks very plausible to me, that nearby pulsars with positrons being produced in their wind nebulae could plausibly be producing these positrons that are being seen. And then finally, I sort of commented briefly when I showed you the comparison with the expectations from secondary production from cosmic rays, there were no error bars on that, and everything should have an error bar on it. And so these guys... It's not so easy to do these sorts of calculations as it is to do these sorts of calculations, but nonetheless, they've done a sort of valiant analysis of the uncertainties in the propagation model, and they're significant. Possibly not large enough to explain what Pamela's seeing, but nonetheless, there are big error bars on what you expect from cosmic rays. So this excess needn't be as significant as it looks. So I think to summarise this, obviously, I'm not saying that this definitely isn't a sort of dark matter signal, but at the moment, I'm not getting too excited. So what about future prospects? Well, I think the most exciting thing here is that Fermi, formerly known as GLASS, was launched last summer, and it's taking data at the moment, data of the whole sky, and results, I think, are expected sometime soonish. So in particular, one thing is if you were getting something that somehow or other was producing lots of positrons, there would then be lots of positrons 
in the inner regions of the Milky Way where there's large magnetic fields and you're producing all sorts of gamma rays. So Fermi will be able to, I think, check these sorts of scenarios. And in particular, recently, they've been sort of modifying their analysis setups. So they can also detect electrons. So this will be another way of double-checking the Pamela and ATIC things. The ACTs are ongoing, and in particular, I think they're planning more observations of dwarf galaxies, and in particular, the new dwarf galaxies which were found for Sloan, for instance, there's been arguments that plausibly those are more dark matter dominated than the sort of dwarfs that have been known for longer and could potentially be good sources of dark matter annihilation, and I believe these experiments are planning to look at them. What's HES? HES, some Veritas magic. In the longer term, this is a much longer term, we're talking decades, there's something called the Trenkov Telescope Array, which is a sort of scale up for the current generation of things. In terms of antimatter, Pamela, the data taken is ongoing, and as they take more data, they can extend their spectrum to higher energies. And in particular, the higher energies they go out to, you need your dark matter candidate to be more massive than the, spi than the rise is continuing to. So that will constrain these models. In the longer term, I believe there are still plans for AMS to fly on the space station, but I'm not sure about the details of that. In terms of neutrinos, there's Antares and IceCube, and in the longer term, KM cube net. And in this case, sort of data taking is ongoing, but the main thing is they're still building these things. So in the this is a much longer term thing. So I finally thought I should really briefly mention colliders, but I, I know essentially nothing about colliders. So this is an extremely brief, rough overview. So the generic signal of WIMPs at Collider is that you produce them, but because they're weakly interacting, they stream out of the detectors unseen. So they'd be carrying off energy and momentum. So the generic thing you're looking for is missing energy and momentum transverse to the beam direction. Now, in reality, it's not quite that simple. For instance, neutrinos can do something similar, and the detectors aren't perfectly calibrated, etc., etc. So what you need to do will be detect differentiate a WIMP missing energy signal from the standard model and instrumental backgrounds. But, you know, there's lots of clever guys working on this, so what they're trying to do is select models where there's this missing transverse energy and then also look in a little bit more detail at the other things that are produced. And so in SUSY models, what you generically expect is a collision which looks a bit like this. You get gluinos and squarks produced. They decay, producing quark jets and more squarks, and eventually, sort of down at the bottom, this thing here and this thing here are our WIMPs that stream out unseen, but the things that they're going to be looking for, in addition to the missing energy, are these quark jets. And so what they're going to do is then look at this statistically and look for an excess of these events over what you'd expect from the standard model and given taking into account the uncertainties. So obviously whether it's possible to do this depends very much on the underlying sort of parameters of the particle physics model, and in particular how massive the supersymmetric particles are. The lighter they are, obviously, the easier it is to make them. So I hope, really hope the LHC does find something. It'd be really exciting. It would give us some very big clues as to the properties of the particles we need to be looking for. But I'd argue at least that it really wouldn't, we couldn't be sure that we detected the dark matter. And the reason for that is that we wouldn't know that they'd be produced to have a cosmologically relevant abundance. And also they could stream out of the LHC and decay just around the corner. So you wouldn't know that the lifetime was the age, longer than the age of the universe. So, obviously, hopefully the LHC will see something, but it wouldn't, on its own, solve the dark matter problem. So, just to wrap up in the last few minutes, I promised that I'd mention other dark matter candidates. So, from a sort of long-standing particle physics point of view, axions are probably the other sort of long-standing, motivated for other reasons, dark matter candidate. And there are consequences of something called the petri quim symmetry, which is proposed to solve the strong CP problem. And so that essentially is that we expect the strong interaction to violate charge conjugation and parity sort of symmetry. Where you'd expect that to show up experimentally is in the electric dipole moment of the neutron, but when experiments try to measure that, all they do is place a very tight upper limit on its value. In principle, you could explain that by just fine-tuning parameters of your theory, but we don't like fine-tuning. So what these guys did instead was propose a new symmetry, which dynamically explains why this can be so small. And when you introduce a new field, you get a particle associated with that field. And the axion is that particle. Now, so on large scales, it you know, works as a CDM candidate just like WIMPs, but actually, it's very light and very weakly interacting. And so at least if there's enough of them around today to be the dark matter, they won't have been in thermal equilibrium in the early universe. So what they do in the early universe and what they do on very small scales are very different to WIMPs, but nonetheless they're a good CDM candidate. This plot here shows the current constraints on, on equivalently the interaction strength 
or the mass. There are various constraints from cosmology. You don't want to produce too much dark matter. There are constraints from lab searches, and I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. And actually, most interestingly to me, at least, there are long-standing constraints from astrophysics by looking at... The un we understand quite well how stars and supernovae cool. The axions would be an extra sort of channel of cooling. They carry energy away unseen. So you can compare observations with sort of theoretical modelling and sort of rule out these regions of parameter space here. And so, so, that, so we're left with a window where the axions could be the dark matter. It's up here. And now I just mentioned how the experiments are trying to probe that region. So this thing called the Primakov process. If you've got a strong magnetic fields, you can resonantly convert axions to photons if the frequency of the magnetic field is just right. And so there is this experiment called ADMX, which is trying to do this. And so this is a latest set of results in terms of the frequency of the field or equivalently the mass. So this is a range from about two to three micro EV. So this is a very small part of the allowed range. These are their constraints. Now they they depend on the exact model and exactly how the axion interacts. But for one of these two cases, the green line is the sort of typical expected local halo density, and the black line is their constraint. So at least over this small range of masses, they've got the, the sensitivity to detect axion dark matter. So that is nonetheless ongoing. I'll mention sterile neutrinos very briefly, because at least they have earlier been mentioned as a sort of warm dark matter candidate. So these are basically fermions with no standard model couplings, apart from the fact that they can sort of, sort of oscillate in between sort of with standard neutrinos. And they can arise in various sort of extensions of the standard model, in particular in terms of something called the seesaw mechanism, which is a way of explaining neutrino masses. And they can be produced in the early universe via oscillations with standard neutrinos, although there are other production mechanisms. There are constraints from astrophysics, for instance, from large-scale structure, because, because they're warm, they would free stream and suppress the power spectrum on scales where we know there are structures. And also they can decay, producing X-rays. So this isn't the most recent plot, but it was the clearest one I could find. Constraints in terms of the sterile neutrino mass in KV and the mixing angle. So this is assuming this production mechanism. And there's this, this range which is excluded by X-rays, and you end up with sort of this small allowed range in here. So they are a viable candidate, but they're beginning to get squeezed by data, I think. So finally, to wrap that up, sort of coming back to the beginning, that WIMPs are generically a good dark matter candidate. And in terms of concrete WIMP candidates, there are extensions of the standard model which provide us with them. And in particular, supersymmetry, which really is the model of standard physics beyond the standard model, it produces the lightest neutralino, which is a good WIMP candidate. And so it's a good idea for what the dark matter could be, so we'd like to detect it. And so you can do that directly by elastic scattering in the lab, indirectly via annihilation products, or you can make them at colliders and go looking for the missing transverse energy. So I think, and I hope I've convinced you, that there are good prospects for a detection in the next few years. But I think hopefully it's become clear that in all of these cases, there are backgrounds. In, for direct detection, neutron backgrounds are an issue. For indirect detection, astrophysical production is an issue. So I think that there are good prospects for detection, but really to com be completely convincing, we're probably going to need signals in different experiments, in different channels, and they'll need to be com compatible with each other, as in the WIMP properties you'd extract from them need to be the same. And then to, just to mention, to be fair, but to most of the attention of the community is focused on WIMPs, but there are other, are other plausible and detectable dark matter candidates, in particular axions. And I'll just wrap up with a list of suggested references. So this is a list of classic reviews. And these things, they get more complex as you go down this list. So if you want your Feynman diagrams, then this old but classic review paper is where you can find them. The one thing I would emphasize, though, is to just be aware of there's been significant improvements in observational evidence and constraints over the past few years. So anything that's a few years old, the details are going to have changed since then. If you'd like to see um, overviews of the recent status, here's some papers. They're all just about a year old, looking at indirect detection, an overview of everything, and direct detection. And finally, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about Pamela and its interpretation as a WIMP annihilation, I'd recommend the introductions of these two papers. The first one looks very carefully at whether pulsars could explain the excess instead. The second one looks at it in terms of a large dark matter clump nearby. I, I don't think that's necessarily a good explanation, but the introduction's very nice. So I'll leave it there. <laughs>
great talk. Uh, two questions. Uh, one about Donald, but the other one about the uh, glass. So um, you, you put a lot of emphasis on the uh, physical backgrounds, the black hole, and so on. Uh, now, Simon earlier said, yes, that is a problem, but maybe the spectrum will allow you, the energy spectrum, to distinguish uh, the back or foregrounds or backgrounds from the dark matter signal. You didn't mention that. We, well, you didn't put emphasis on that. So what, what should be the <coughs> realistic to think that uh, we know the expected spectrum well enough to be able to subtract the astrophysical sources, or is that pretty hopeless? So I think sort of generically, sort of MSSM, the WIMP contribution, that there are generic ideas that are fairly solid. What worries me perhaps more is the subtraction of the astrophysical backgrounds, but I'm really not an expert on that. So it may, may be that it's possible, but it's going to need clever people doing the calculation carefully, not particle physicists charging in and just fitting data. Yeah, but if the spectrum's different, you think you just, you can subtract it like people with the CMB, for example. But, but, I mean, for instance, I, I remember back when I was a PhD student, there was a lot of worry about foregrounds in the CMB. They turned out to be not as big a problem as people were worried, but in this case, the foregrounds, yeah, might turn out to be a big problem. So, or well, foregrounds, okay. backgrounds, but... Can I ask your opinion on that? Going back to that. So you had a reference to uh, some work by Neil Weinig. Yeah. Who actually claims that uh, if you have wimps that can, uh, in the sky, that, uh, can scatter inelastically... So, okay, yeah, I, I mentioned that on the slide, but didn't actually say anything in words. Yeah, what is, is, that a, is that a viable uh, explanation from a particle physics point of view, or is it just clutching a straw? S somewhere in between. It. So, to, to fill in the details, and another possible explanation for this annual modulation that the DAMA direct detection experiment is seeing is something called inelastic dark matter, which Neil Wiener and collaborators propose, which is where you've got a dark matter candidate in an excited state just a little bit higher in energy, and so what you're seeing is, is that being excited. So... I, I, it's not something that you would have predicted a priori from particle theory, but I don't think it's completely silly either. But the main thing here is that actually with their model, they would be predicting if it's compatible with current exclusion limits from other experiments, but those the data doesn't have to get much better before it's ruled out. And so Neil, at least last time I spoke to him, was very excited about the Zeppelin three data and exactly how many events they had and what energy they had. So it's testable at least and could be ruled out or sort of have more evidence in its favour sort of fairly soon. Thank you for, it. Thank you for your complete review. Uh, in a few words, uh, what is the main idea and the main technolog technological challenge for the direct uh, directional detectors, I mean the wind telescope? S sorry, do you mean...? What, what is the main idea to, to find direction in the... Oh, so you mean the directional de direct detection? Okay, so I'll, I'll talk about the experiment which I know most about because it's, it's British. It's something called DRIFT. So it's a gaseous detector filled with carbon sulfide. And so what happens is that when you have a recoil, you get ionisation caused in the gas. So the electrons are very light, so they just diffuse lots. So you, from the distribution of electrons, you couldn't measure a direction. But the electrons combine with the carbon sulfide to to form heavy negative ions, you then apply a field and drift them to a grid of readout wires. And by measuring where on the wires they appear and at what time, you can then reconstruct the direction of the recoil. It's difficult, and they've been working on it for a long time, but it looks like they're beginning to, to get it working. The difficult thing will then be, as the exclusion limits go down, the size of the detector you need goes up. So, to be absolutely honest, and my, my collaborators might shoot me for saying this, if we don't see some sort of signal soon, then you're going to get to the point that directional detectors would have to be the size of Olympic swimming pools. So for this to be plausible, we, we've got to hope that one of the non-directional detection experiments sees something in the next few years. Uh, is there any favoring of uh, that, does the experiments or observations do they favor a specific neutrino channel like the <coughs> or Higgsino and would it help to know uh, to have some theoretical constraints for example do you have theoret theoretical constraints uh, that would favor a specific channel like say would favor Higgsino more than Dino? 
would that influence the criteria for designing the observation of experiments? Um, so in terms of criteria, I don't think so, as in you just try and build the best experiment you can, and basically that's a, a, that means sensitive to as big a range of cross-sections as possible. I'm not sure how quickly I can go back. I think theoretical con uh, considerations really don't help too much because there's this large range of possibilities, but this Monte Carlo Markov chain analysis was taking into account data from B2S gamma and the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon, and that then starts constraining the, the nature of the neutralino and the channels. And so that's what then ends up giving you this sort of restricted range of parameter space there. So it's not so much theory, but complementary sort of collider-based experiments that can help you out there. But nonetheless, from an experimental point of view, you just want to push these exclusion limits as far down as you possibly can. Well, well, I mean, it's certainly it's sort of more encouraging if you know you've got models which are plausible and motivated here than if they're down there. Yeah. So on your slide where you showed the Arctic results, there was a third data set which seemed to be consistent with expectation for the background. So is there some understanding of this? Um, and the second question would be, so the, the energy range is very high, 600 GV or so. So what would be the glider prospects for, for wind surges in the path range? Is that already like that? Um, so I'm not sure I can answer either of these questions properly, but I'll, I'll try the second one first. And I, and I think you're absolutely right that obviously you need a dark matter candidate that's more massive than in the sort of annihilation project. So yeah, I would guess that that would be getting difficult for the LHC, but, but I'm not an expert. And in, in particular, ATIC, I think is extremely difficult to explain in the context of neutralinos. I, I think people are tending to do it either by annihilating neutralinos or calusa klein dark matter. So I think that Pamela, you can sort of do sort of, but ATIC gets even tougher. In terms of the um, other experiments, I must admit I know essentially nothing about that. I'm guessing the systematic errors are pretty hefty, but as in what, what you're seeing there are statistical error bars. I'm guessing if you included systematics, they'd, they'd be much bigger, but that, that's just a guess. Yes, so you made a comment about uh, doing the neutralino uh, astronomy sources, that's correct, but the kind of features that I, I discussed in my own talk are actually features in the energy distribution, so they don't depend on the direction that the object is coming. So in practice, you could detect this even for a non-directional detector. The ringer, of course, is those of energy in the inertial frame, rest of the frame, the center of the galaxy, so they get blurred out by the fact that they have a 12 of a second motion. And nevertheless, there would be some hope. I guess the other thing that sort of bothers me about those features as well as the differential event rate is an integral over the speed distribution. So inevitably, any f features in the speed distribution are smeared out That's in the energy. Fact, it would be much easier to detect these if the dark matter turned out to be axions. Yes, so the, the axions would be brilliant. You could then just measure it off. Whereas, yeah, features in... The, I think, it, though, actually, I'd argue that perhaps it's a good thing that features in the speed distribution don't affect the recall spectrum much. It, mean, it means the uncertainties of the experiments are smaller. So from an astron astronomical point of view, it's a shame, but it's probably a good thing. Well, then the other question was what, why you are not convinced by the, uh, by the fact that distribution should be smooth. Because after all, it's not based directly on the simulation, but it's based on the phase space argument of geometry of the sheets. So, Okay, so you, I think you, I, I obviously completely buy your argument that there's, the dark matter distribution can't be zero because of the, the sheets, but that... The, 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 I'm not sure I'd necessarily believe it's 0, 0 0.3 GeV per cubic centimetre in every sort of... Well, the, the geometry of the sheets, the, the three-dimensional sheets, so that means except in exceptional places, like caustic, they fill the three-dimensional volume of space. So the question is, what is the characteristic scale in which that three-dimensional uh, distribution varies within a single sheet? And that's all the all the simply of the bottom scale, so that's... So that's the argument the argument's not, not based directly on the simulation, it's based on, on the geometry of the sheets with respect to the theoretical, theoretical grounds of the fact that we have this uh, contorted three-dimensional phase sheet, the distribution of dark matter. 
the only place that's highlighted is inside the substructure. So once, once you believe the individual bound lumps are not dominant, the rest Yeah, and I definitely believe that. The, the I think I'm going to have to think, think about the phase-based sub-argument, because the argument which I've sort of read in your papers was from the density of streams falling off and an estimate of the local number of streams. And, and so that, I think, is obviously an argument which is order of magnitudes. Where, but what you've just said sounds more watertight, so I'm going to have to go away and think about that. So I'm not quite sure I understand what either of your questions are. So, so the first one would be, would, would we be able to detect uh, dark matter um, that part of it got ripped off by a black hole or would it emit um, energy of some sort? So, I mean, are you thinking about the galactic center? Yeah. I, I think actually the accretion rate onto the central black hole is actually pretty small. So I, I, black hole makes the dark matter more central. Possible. Yeah, so that's the important the thing. That you, yeah. yeah, so you, you could plausibly get an enhanced annihilation rate from the dark matter surrounding the black hole, but the, the actual accretion onto it is, very, is actually small. So what was the second question? Uh, the second one was that, uh, well, we talked about black holes being generated by, by black stars, but we didn't talk about, or was it totally silly? Well, completely randomly, my other research interest is primordial black holes that form in the early universe. So this would be if you have very large density perturbations on small scales. Soon after horizon entry, these things can plausibly collapse to form black holes. And this is actually a very powerful way of constraining models of the uni early universe on small scales that aren't probed cosmologically. People do talk about these primordial black holes as a dark matter candidate. However, I don't think they're a very good dark matter candidate because the problem is that they're formed by nonlinear processes. So what you tend to do is the density is either essentially zero or you fill the universe